Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good morning. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama. Another program all about leadership. I have today a guest all the way from an island called Maui, where my father was born and raised. And we met in 2011, in fact, the same year when I relocated from Tokyo to Maui. And he is with uh, the uh, mathematics department of UH Maui College. His name is Amir Hossein Amizlani, and he's uh, been working on teaching mathematics, teaching all kinds of subjects in an innovative way, and we're going to talk about that. And, but first off, I'm going to say welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, let's go back in time, uh, Amir, and uh, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Tehran, Iran, um, 40 years ago, almost. Uh, and um, so I actually uh, got my high school diploma, my bachelor's, and my master's degrees all back home. Uh, I got my bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering control right. systems. Then, after that, do you want to ask a question or should I continue? <laughs> <laughs> Let me be the host. <laughs> but uh, uh, before we go into your uh, uh, graduate studies, right. when can you say that in your, uh, in your schooling or teacher or something that says, wow, I'm passionate about numbers and mathematics, when did that happen? Um, well, um, a couple of things. First of all, uh, culturally, um, in Middle East in general and in Iran in particular, um, you're successful, or at least you are considered successful, if you're a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer. So there is some sort of pressure on you to succeed, um, at least scientifically, and go as far as you can. Um, because of that, there is some sort of, well, mostly healthy, sometimes not so healthy competition uh, among students to um, get accepted to better institutions to go as far as they can. Mm -hmm. And so we really took science education and math education, among other things, seriously. But was there a teacher that uh, uh, you remember? Was yes, it, uh, yes, we had good teachers. Okay. But also, we, because we were serious about, because the path to success okay. for us was studying, right. and it was sort of established in our minds. So it so. was internal. I mean, you, yes. uh, students like you came to class uh, wanting to learn math exactly. and science. Exactly. And that was, I mean, the path to success, as I would know, would be that. I mean, I would love to learn more about mathematics, more about physics, more about science, in order to succeed right. there. So there was a hunger. There was hunger, a hunger. exactly. Okay. And, and your classes, were they very large, small? Uh, I mean, uh, um, relatively large. I mean, um, in comparison with, uh, say, classes at UH Maui College, um, I sometimes have 10 to 15 oh, students. Oh, that's small. Uh, we were like 30, 30 oh, something okay, students okay. in high school. Yeah, all right. uh, for about well, university, depending on the course. If it was a core course like calculus right. or something, 120 in well, a lecture well, hall. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then for more um, specialized courses, right. well, fewer, like 15, 20. Now, for your graduate school, uh, you went to, um, um, of course, you got a master's in, in, in Iran, but yes. you went for your PhD in Canada, am yes. I correct? Yes. And where, where was that? It was in uh, a city called London, Ontario, uh, University of Western Ontario, a very good university. I started there um, as a student in electrical engineering. Uh, but then, uh, and that was the thing, I've been always interested in the theory behind engineering. Okay, right. Why things work as they do. Okay. Um, and of course, you have to know about the mathematics behind it, the yeah. science behind it. And that was too strong for me, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I decided to switch to applied mathematics, oh. which is, you know, it's practically um, engineering minus the design part. Right. Because you work with computers, right. you design techniques, yeah, it, well, you Well, mathematics is everything, yes, semiconductors yes. and yeah. coding and exactly. so forth. I mean, you can, it, is, it is everywhere. Exactly. You yeah. can simulate all these things 
like I said, even if you like, you can go further and design it. And right, right, right. But you were really interested in the product. You were yeah. uh, interested in uh, how does it work? Yeah. Uh, what is the foundation yes. for uh, how products are? How can we tweak things to yeah. make things better? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And, and, and this led you to teaching? Uh, yes, well, uh, in general, well, my personality is such that um, I like teaching, I like research. I, well, um, I guess, I consider myself a lifelong learner, so you, I always love to learn. And of course, you've been publishing uh, uh, yes, papers, yes, research, yes, uh, peer-reviewed yes. journals, and yes. so forth. You continue to do that. Yeah, but but today we're here to really discuss your passion yes. about about an area in in, in education. And uh, what what did you uh, talk about that? And how you came or your early interaction with uh, problem-based uh, uh, learning in Canada that led you to today? Sure. Uh, well, as a PhD student uh, back in, I want to say 2004, 2005, I uh, got accepted to a program called uh, IPSW, Industrial Problem Solving Workshop. Um, it was a two-week program for graduate students and postdocs, where uh, the first week was a dry run. Um, someone with a problem that they had already solved would be the mentor of, I mean, let's say we have 40 students uh, divided into five groups of eight, right. for example. So five mentors, each with a already, an already solved problem, right. but they pretended to be an open problem, right. and they would give it to us, and we would be working on that for one week. Okay. Um, that was the preparation for the second week when we had an authentic, real-life, open-ended problem, say, for example, from Shell, from uh, some cancer research institutes. From the private sector. Uh, yes, they were, private you know, sector. They were interested yes. in seeing how people from the outside in academia would yes. approach this problem. Exactly. And, and uh, well, uh, we had really good results. Sometimes mm -hmm. they would uh, otherwise have spent, like, um, millions of dollars oh, right. to, to address the same problem right. that got solved for them in a week. And sometimes <laughs> the answer was no, there was no solution. <laughs> right. So they oh. wouldn't invest right, on right, that right. idea. And that's better sometimes yeah, because you yeah. save money sure. and, and, and direct your funds on another research topic. And let me tell you, it was a win-win-win-win situation for everyone. As a grad student, I got exposed to real-life applications of mathematics. Right. Um, it was a great opportunity for instructors, for uh, faculty members, to recruit grad students, mm. postdocs, right. among those right. participants. It was a great opportunity for those companies to hire right, right, people right. right after graduation. Right. So it was, and of course, uh, it was a great opportunity scientifically for everyone working on a real-life problem, practicing what you've seen. So is it really a bridge between yes. uh, the private sector, research, right. students, instructors? It's really exactly. a kind of ecosystem that you develop uh, uh, working together so that you really have uh, a really, uh, you know, a mathematical foundation to uh, problems, but you're approaching problems from the real life, from the exactly. real world. Exactly, and because you're in a group, uh, for one thing, a good thing about that is there's no competition you all have the same goal, addressing the problem, solving the problem. And the problems are interesting problems. Well, you, so you, you, men yeah, you mentioned that it first originated in the medical community. Uh, uh, problem, the yeah. idea, okay, so here's the thing. Yeah. Uh, after a couple of years, um, I got hired to run this oh, program, right, okay. which was a great right. opportunity as part of my postdoc. Uh, and back then, I was amazed by how well it works. Hmm how effective it was. But I couldn't explain it, and I, my <laughs> right. background was not education. Right, right, right. So I um, talked to some of my colleagues from yeah. College of Education right. back then at University of Calgary in Canada, and they told me that the best way to explain this would be problem-based learning. Oh, okay. And so that's how I got exposed to the idea right. of problem-based learning, right. which I continued. And Okay, want, and, and, and so uh, you, you really were exposed to this uh, world <laughs> called uh, problem-based learning back in Canada. 
and you uh, land here on, at the U.S. Maui College uh, back in 2011, and, and uh, you must have seen Maui as a grand experiment for your uh, for the ideas yes. uh, that you uh, had honed, uh, you know, leading uh, these groups uh, on Maui. But Maui, of course, is different because uh, there, there aren't many universities and postdocs right. in front of it. What, uh, 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 what changes did you make to the model on Maui? Uh, well, as you said, uh, the first and foremost thing would be scaling down. Uh, because we do not have, it's not like it, back in Canada it was a nationwide thing uh, and you had, there were always enough students, more than enough students, grad students, postdoc. Here on Maui there are not very many grad students right, to begin exactly, with. Yeah. Uh, and so we decided to make it something, a program for high school and early college students to begin with. Uh, and um, what I did was I sort of looked for people who might be interested in the idea. Mm. Fortunately, back then, the director of our Upward Bound program, which is part of TRIO, um, something um, funded by DOE, I believe. Right. Uh, and uh, she was really supportive of, of the idea, so we piloted this uh, at that level um, for three years, three summers. Uh, when, when did it start? Around? Um, I want to say the first one well, 2013, was 2013 or 13, 14. Okay. Yes, right. yes. And then uh, after three years, so the first one, I'm going to explain that later if you want, right. uh, but the first one was a problem. So again, we uh, did not necessarily have access to Shell. Right, right, right. I mean, uh, we're talking But there about, are companies well, on Maui. Yes, yeah, yes. There are companies. And, and yeah, also companies. Uh, yeah. cultural sites and right. things like that. So uh, we approached the Koei Fish Fund and ask them to uh, supply a central problem. Because for problem-based learning, you, you need an authentic central problem. And that problem came from the fish pond. And where is this fish pond? Can you give me? In uh, Kihei. Uh, in it's, Kihei, yes. all right. It's, it's, and, and it's uh, uh, way up more towards uh, McKenna, am I correct? Yes, yeah. yes. And, and it's been there for uh, um, hundreds of years. Generations, yeah, yes. Hundreds of years. And it used to be a, a great and amazing source of food for the entire Maui. So That's it's related to history, yes, to culture, Native Hawaiian yes. um, culture, also to, uh, well, uh, sustainability. Exactly, they were, they That's were, the whole They point. were growing fish <laughs> yes. to uh, sustain themselves. To feed on, the entire island right, without uh, uh, having to rely on any external support. Right, so, yes. so it's a, a brilliant use of the ocean right. uh, for their, uh, to uh, feed the community. Exactly. And uh, now, uh, this is an interesting problem because, uh, of course, you have major hotels nearby, residents, Right. Kihei is, of course, one of the most populated areas on Maui now, uh, and also how to preserve and how to uh, sustain su uh, such a, a project when uh, you know you've lost a lot of those uh, tr uh, traditional kinds of uh, learnings in, right. uh, 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 since before. Uh, well, we're going to get back to more in depth on that, uh, but I think you know uh, what I'm learning is that it's. Uh, uh, is that um, it's interdisciplinary. I, th I think that, that's one of the major things I'm uh, learning from you. It's not like it's all about math. It's, it's math is part of that. And we'll get back to how the students use math right. from after we take this break.
we're back. We're back uh, with my guest, Amir Hossein Amizlani from UH Maui College, an old friend. And we've been talking about problem-based learning and how to really attack problems. And we're talking about a fish pond in Kihei that I'm quite aware of. And how, what kind of students and, and, and what happened during this project? Uh, what was the outcome? Well, not the outcome, but how did the students use um, uh, uh, tools and resources? And what was the outcome of this project? Uh, well, uh, let me explain a little bit about uh, the theory behind okay. problem-based learning, why it works the way it does. Uh, it's based on two main theories in education, constructionism and situated learning. Uh, let's put it this way. If you are working on something that is near and dear to your heart, mm -hmm. a problem from your community, from right. your city, from your country, right. um, so your goal is to solve that problem. Right. And then it happens that you need some mathematics mm, in order right. to solve that yeah. problem. You need some physics, some right. science. Right. Of course, yeah. You actually welcome that mathematics, oh, that physics. Right, right. You learn without yeah. noticing. You <laughs> learn while you're enjoying. Because yeah. your goal is not just learning right. mathematics through possibly dry lectures right. or physics. You own the uh, learning process. And it's important for the teacher, which we should call actually a mentor right. uh, in this case, uh, to refrain from lecturing. Right. It's, yeah. it's about being a team working right. on a problem. It can go in any direction. We have to recognize that there may be several solutions to the same problem, depending on how you look at it. So uh, from... Um, execution standpoint, there's a lot of front load preparation for oh, that. Okay. We have to interpret the problem correctly. Right. We have to make sure that we've sort of anticipated the scenarios that may come out, um, the type of questions that students may ask, okay. and we need to have resources ready. So that's there's a, why. There's a lot of uh, teacher preparation. You're, yes, that's what you're in saying. that sense. Yeah, and yeah. that's why we have a training for oh, trainers, oh, oh. professional development thing for uh, the teachers, instructors of this program. But um, it's important to note that it has to be a teamwork. Right. Everyone must enjoy what's happening. Right. And for that to happen, we need to select the problems uh, really carefully. Mm -hmm. They need to be authentic, related to your community, right. your city. Um, so so the fish pond fits all those categories. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, given that um, a high percentage of the participants were from native Hawaiian background, right, right, it right. was really a great experience for them. They loved it. They worked on it. Uh, they even learned about things like, say, double integration, high school kids. Uh, before even entering college, hmm. which is something they would see in calculus three or four. They just saw how they would find the volume of the pond using strings right, right. and push pins, for example, yeah. um, and measuring the depth, hmm. at some random points right. inside the meshes that, that they had created. And they added up, and with a good accuracy, they got the volume of the pond, which is technically what we know as double integration. Wow. Now, yeah. one could right. show them the same thing right. through limit right. and um, sigma right. and, uh, the, I don't know, taking the limit, uh, something xn goes to infinity and things like that, which is great. I mean, I'm not saying that it shouldn't happen that way. But when you've done this before yeah. and you've seen this in action, you can relate way better. Mm. Another thing that I would like to highlight here is that, uh, and I guess you mentioned as well, it's not really right to say that I teach, say, calculus through problem-based learning mm. or I teach physics. Okay. It's not about one subject right. or one class. Okay. Uh, we're talking about, I mean, if we really want to change the curriculum, it has to be one semester or one year mm. revolving a, around one central right. problem. So then you are ready to expose them to the physics of it. Right. So, the ideal case would be a super class or a um, learning community of sorts where the physics instructor is there, the math instructor is there, the chemistry, biology, 
So the physics instructor says F equals M times A. At the same time, the math teacher can say something about this is the second derivative, for example. And this is how we solve this part of the problem using this knowledge. But of course, there's other parts of the puzzle or the problem, dealing with politics, yes. <laughs> dealing with the neighborhood, oh, yeah, dealing with people, cultural. dealing with uh, uh, cultural yeah. uh, issues. So you're correct that uh, in real life, uh, things are not neat and, and clean in, in three or four months. Mm, yes. It might uh, dribble and, and, and kind of uh, accumulate, and there's stops and goes over a year exactly. or more. And that's real life. And, and that's what our job is about right, in project right. management in Google or AOL or many companies I work for, it, it's uh, that uh, it's not very clean. But uh, again, you know what you, you get to know what you don't know also, and try to get the experts and resources, and, or find out on yourself. And so you actually are learning as you proceed on your project. Exactly, and that's why when we train the trainers, um, we expose them to the same problems that they would be working on with their students in the summertime, first of all. Then we make sure that we have one teacher from natural sciences background, one from physical sciences in its broad sense, and one um, helping them with technical writing and cultural aspects, oh. because culture is important. Because again, that's about situated learning. If the question, if the problem, the central problem, is related to your culture, right you feel better tackling the problem. Now, now, we were talking about this before the show, that uh, you felt that uh, the students on Maui are the same anywhere. Yeah. Yes. But what they lack sometimes is confidence. Exactly. And what is the confidence? Is it them themselves, in their community? What, what, what is the confidence? Uh, well, I believe, um, and maybe I'm wrong, but that's based on my observation. They think that no one expects that much, that high of them. Um, they sell themselves short. I mean, in the sense that uh, they can do great things if they want to. And we've had some really great examples of successful students studying, uh, coming from Maui high schools. Um, we know one of them, right, right. Uh, yes. Syracuse University. We have MIT students. We have UCLA students. And um, so uh, it's possible for them. They need to be challenged, and they need to gain confidence that they can do exactly as any other student everywhere. And of course, thanks to technology, nowadays they don't really need to go to any particular class. They don't need to physically attend a class to succeed, to learn things. Now, you're, 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 um, you're efforts in this area has been rewarded recently by the, uh, uh, by the government, uh, the yes. NSF grant. Can you tell us uh, something about how you're kind of moving this uh, idea forward uh, throughout sure. the state? Yes. So uh, like I said, we piloted this problem-based learning um, through our upward bound program uh, just on Maui. After three years, uh, fortunately, we got uh, an NSF grant um, over $1 million for three years. And now we have three sites, UH Hilo Upward Bound, uh, Windward Community College Upward Bound, and UH Maui College Upward Bound. Uh, so um, over the course of these three years, uh, we hopefully work with uh, 90 students per year, so 270 wow. students it will take. Uh, and uh, also we train um, teachers because part of this program is right. a professional development. Uh, and it's a good opportunity to, to advertise it for STEM teachers across the state of Hawaii. So you're evangelizing other teachers to yes. also pick this uh, yes. uh, uh, project-based uh, uh, learning Problem also based in learning, other, yes. other areas of the, of the community. Yes, yes. I mean. Um, uh, we're not forcing them necessarily to choose that, but this is a great idea, and we need to uh, create a culture that is acceptable to that. For example, let's say assessment. If you train kids using this method, it's not fair to give them the same test that you would oh, give right, to right, students right. that are taught to the test. Right. Well, right. it's not fair because. Right. But here we are trying to address these through this three-year implementation, right. or let's say research phase. Right. Uh, hopefully after that, we would like to go for a five-year implementation uh, phase as well, if this becomes successful. But uh, 
time constraint because one thing is, like I said, if we can make the entire curriculum of the year revolve around a central problem, that would be awesome. Yeah. But, but we have only five weeks. Right. Uh, uh, but this is a great concept. Uh, that's yes. what you're trying yes. to prove yes. of concept. Yes. 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 And perhaps in the future, the universities and colleges could, yes. uh, could also uh, be uh, uh, revolving so that they, they would be attacking a problem through one year, two years, and more yeah. throughout their uh, college career and, and uh, applying tools and resources. Exactly. That's the plan. I mean, that oh. would be ideal for us. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much much. Oh, We're at the end of the show, uh, but I think what you're driving toward, and I hope you're evangelizing, will foster a whole new generation of instructors. We'll I take hope this so. forward. And as you know, upper bound are economically challenged uh, you know, uh, young people from communities like Kalihi Palama, yeah. where I'm from too. And, but uh, as, you, uh, as you rightly pointed out, if you're passionate about the problem, yeah. you will learn anything exactly. to really solve it. If you can relate to the problem at hand, uh, nothing really seems impossible to you. Um, you won't get bored. You keep working, you keep trying, and you succeed. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank and you. And this is Ray Tuchiyama, all about leadership, and I hope you enjoy the show. <laughs>